Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 13. We're going to encourage every single person in the house, be ye unmarried, divorced, or widowed. We want to encourage you, or widowered. Hebrews 13. When you read this, you're going to think, what does that have to do with singles? Stay with me. Stay with me. For years... The church preaches on marriage for decades, for centuries. Why? Because marriage is under attack, right? And when a divorce happens, if we can prevent it, we have, we have strengthened the faith of children. Their prayers are answered. We have done a lot of things. But if you're single, you feel kind of like second class, and I do not want that. You are not second class. You are first class. And so married folks, listen to this sermon because the Lord can use you to encourage single people. So this message is for us all. Can you say everybody? Everybody. Everybody. All right. Verse four. Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness, Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. Let's pray. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that your word would come alive in each of our hearts. May the same spirit, Holy Spirit, we ask you, who inspired holy people to write the words that we love inspire us to understand and apply to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So last Sunday, we spoke on honoring marriage as an institution. Today, we're going to speak on honoring singleness as an institution. Who knows? God can call a person to be single. He can do it. And the church ignores that. We used to have a regular guy come around here who was prophetic, but he always trying to get people married. And I asked him, do not do that. Stop teasing our singles. He wouldn't do it. And uh, you haven't seen him around for years. Do not tease single people. Do not question their character. Do not try to marry them off. Honor them. Honor them. Can I get a big amen? Amen. Do it. So I pray you'll be empowered in that area. I'm not thinking of anybody in particular, so. (laughs) Marriage is honorable among all in the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. What does that have to do with singleness? Well, it has to do with a single person applying it to their life as I proclaim these truths in light of the scripture. With our Lord's help, singleness can be honorable. Can I get an amen? Amen. Single people do not have to be living lives of sin because they don't have somebody to cuddle with at night. God knows there's enough married people living in sin, right? So married people can live honorable lives. Single people can live honorable lives. With our Lord's help, singleness can be undefiled. Their beds can be undefiled by sin. You can do it. God instituted it. You'll see. With our Lord's help, singleness can be purified. Who cares about the past? We're living today. Can we say now? From this day forward, we're going to do God's will. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now we're called to live a life of obedience and purity to the Lord. If you do that every day, you're living a lifestyle of purity, regardless of what the past was. Mary Magdalene was a hooker. The Lord purified her life, did he not? I need a bigger amen. Amen. With our Lord's help, singleness can be unselfish. Let your conduct be, this applies to married and single people, let your conduct be without covetousness. 
You know, the 10th commandment kind of wraps up the other commandments, thou shalt not covet. If you don't covet, you find yourself obeying, not stealing, not committing adultery. In fact, the full commandment is, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's stuff. You get the gist of it. So with our Lord's help, singleness can be honorable, undefiled, purified, and unselfish. With their Lord's help, singles can be content. Be content with such things as you have. You can be content. You can live a life that is not bitter, not jealous, not wanting to be somebody you're not called to be. Well, I don't feel called. Well, then pray and seek the Lord. A man who finds a wife finds a good thing. Marriage is honorable among all in the bed undefiled. But if you're called to singleness, embrace it. With their Lord's help, singles can be confident. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In the Greek language, that's a quintuple negative. Literally, he says, I will never not leave you nor never no forsake you. That's bad English. But in other languages, when you repeat a negative, the, the second negative doesn't cancel out the first one. You know, I can't get no satisfaction means you can get satisfaction, right? No, we know what we mean when we do it. We do it ourselves, but our grammar teachers make us perfectionists, I guess. So he's emphasizing the negative. I will never leave you. So singles, you are not alone. He's as close as a mention of his name. Draw near to him. Go vertical. Did we not go vertical today? Yes. <laughs> we need to do that every day. With their Lord's help, singles can be fearless. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So stop doubting your identity. Embrace your calling and walk in the identity you have in Christ. Husbands, your identity does not come from your wife. It comes from the Lord. You know, the Lord at the very beginning said that two will become one and he told them to multiply. And we know that means generations to come because children is addition. It's not a multiplication. The multiplication comes into place when you have grandchildren, Right? So how do you become one when you're two different people? It's called multiplication. Marriage is not 50-50 or 90-10 or 75-25. You'll always be fighting over who's got, this, who's got the greater burden. It's 100% commitment on your part to your marriage. It's multiplication. It's one times one equals one. Let me, let me explain to you fractionally or mathematically why 50-50 doesn't work. What is 50% times 50%? 25%. What is one half times one half? A quarter. It doesn't work. So when you get married, you want to be a whole person and contribute your whole person to the relationship in spite of what the other person does. If you married half a person and you're a whole person, one times a half doesn't, it is at least half, right? But if you're half-hearted, they're half-hearted, you're going to become less than what you were before you got married. So singles, the goal in life is to become whole and gather your identity from the Lord Jesus Christ where you don't need a man or you don't need a woman, you need Jesus. And we're whole in him. And if you get married, you will be happily married because a happy marriage is two funerals and one resurrection. <laughs> if I'm only half dead, I'm miserable, right? Go ahead and die. Let Jesus live. The threefold cord that's not easily broken is where two people die to themselves and let the Lord live. And so a happy single is one who dies to their self and lets the Lord reign supreme in their life. In spite of what the culture tells you, in spite of sometimes what the church has told you, you walk in God's will and man your battle station. Amen. With their Lord's help, singles can be heroes. How do I know? The Bible has got a lot of heroes in it, and many of them 
are singles. My heroes have often been cowboys. They've often been single. For four years, my family lived in Liberia, West Africa. When I was nine years old, we moved there and came back when I was 13. Our first year there, we were based at this mission base in Fasima, Liberia, in the land of the Belly people, B-E-L-L-E. And this mission base was established decades before we got there by two women. Single women. Took more than three days hacking a trail through the jungle, and we're talking dense jungle, to the assignment. The government would give you a visa to be a missionary, but they would assign a community to you so that you would establish a school. Otherwise, they wouldn't give you a visa. So it was a clever way of educating their population by assigning communities to mission agencies. And so they were assigned to this village, and for the first time, They hacked their way through there and established this mission base. We lived there for a year. Here's the lot of kids. The nine-year-old is me. Mac is on my hip, the monkey. Later, a missionary arrived, another single lady, and she died. Her grave was there. When you went in missions back in the day, there was no, you know, round-trip tickets No three-year terms. I mean, it was a commitment for life. And so single people really have a freedom to do incredible things for God that a person with a family is limited with. Can we just give the singles in the house a hand? You guys can do awesome things for God. In the Bible, we have heroes who are single. Miriam. We would not have a Moses today were it not for his single sister. There's no record of her ever getting married. Often when a woman is mentioned in the Bible because it's so patriarchal, the husband is mentioned. Deborah, I thought she was single. No, her husband was mentioned. Jael, I thought she was single. Her husband was mentioned. But Miriam, she led the first choir, dancing on the banks of the Red Sea after Pharaoh's armies. We used to sing it. I will sing unto the Lord. I don't know if the same same tune I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. The Lord, my God, my strength, my song, has now become my victory. The Lord, my God. She's she's awesome. Now she got off track. You know, she's kind of prejudiced against Moses' wife, and the Lord dealt with her. She's one of the heroes of the faith. Elijah's a great, one of Israel's greatest prophets. A wild man, kind of like John the Baptist, single, didn't die. God took him to heaven on a fiery chariot. His uh, protege, the man that followed him, Elisha was also a single man who asked for a double portion of Elisha's spirit and performed twice the miracles that Elijah had performed. Well, he died one miracle short, but then later someone opened his grave and threw a dead guy in there, you know, dual I guess a dual purpose grave, right? The guy landed on Elisha's bones, came back to life. His prayer was answered. A mighty single man. Jeremiah, incredible single man. God called him to be single. He was called to do some tough things that a wife just would not be able to put up with. Daniel, single man. How do you know? He was a eunuch. Let me just say this about eunuchs. There's an effort now in the theological world to try to view eunuchs as transgenders. Our culture's sick, right? I mean, I remember when it was a fad, if your kid's overactive, you gotta put the kid on drugs. I saw Penelope Cruz, who's from Spain, interviewed on one of these late night talk shows. And she talked about her childhood, how she was so active. She was in ballet, she was in music, she was in sports, she was in that. And she said, but if I grew up in this country, I wouldn't be in those things. I'd be on drugs. That's America. Boy, I could get on that soapbox. And then the whole self-esteem thing. You know, everybody gets a trophy. 
Everything's about making your kid happy rather than making them disciplined. And now they're castrating them chemically and surgically. It's crazy. And God forbid that you say anything about it. You remember the the nursery story of the emperor that wanted special clothes and his tailors fooled him (laughs) by weaving clothes that were nothing? And he goes out in public and the crowd is afraid to tell the truth. So everybody's ooing and eyeing. Who's seen this story? It's, it's been animated more than once. Oh, the emperor, you're wonderful. Oh, man, your tailor's amazing. And the tailors are playing along. And in the crowd, a little girl speaks up. Her mom's trying to hush her. And the king silences the people and has a little girl come forward. And she says, you got no clothes. You're naked. And everybody gasped, and he thanked her for being honest. And the corruption was exposed. This is what's happening in our culture. The emperor has no clothes, and people are pretending. We're doing ourselves no favor by pretending that the emperor is not naked. So eunuchs were made eunuchs so they could be trusted to deal with the king's harem or with the queen because they had been neutered. But they were still men. Their DNA had not changed. They were unique. Eunuchs. Then there's the famous Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. You may know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They too were linked eunuchs. Mighty men of God. Single. Heroes of the faith. Then there's John the baptizer. The cousin of Jesus. Single, what a bold witness. No wife at home saying, you better quieten down. You're going to lose your head. No, he went for it. And he did lose his head. Then John the apostle. Lived longer than any of the 12. And Jesus entrusted him with the care of his mother in her older years. So when she became single, she had someone to take care of her. The Catholic Church has this story of her going to Ephesus when John was the pastor there and living with him. Of course, they have some other stories I'm not sure about. Anyway, so these are single heroes. Mary Magdalene, the first evangelist, the first witness. She wasn't home cooking bacon. Well, being Jewish, she wouldn't cook bacon and eggs. But she wasn't home fixing breakfast for her husband or for her family. She was devoted to her Savior, and went to just check his grave and found it empty and came back proclaiming the good news. She could do that because she was single. She was, can you say, mobile. Now, single pe- married people, don't sit there wishing you were single. I often encourage single people by telling them this. It's better to be single wishing you were married than to be married wishing you were single. You embrace You embrace the cross and follow Jesus and be the best spouse that God ever made. There will be fruitfulness and fulfillment in your life. But today, we're not encouraging you. We're encouraging singles. It's their turn for once in a life. I challenge pastors, if any of you would ever get sent this video, do something different. When you preach on marriage, preach to singles and encourage them. They need it. You take the singles out of this church, we're in trouble anyway. Why would you not encourage one of the most powerful tools in the church? Single people. Barnabas, he had time to take Paul under his wing who nobody trusted. Is he? Think about it. Paul's killing Christians legally, and then suddenly he shifts gears. Doesn't that sound suspicious? He's jumped parties. If you're a Republican, you're probably jealous of Tulsi right now. Not jealous of her, but suspicious of Tulsi Gabbard. Like, is she pulling a fast one? Do we trust her? So they had that, but Barnabas had, as a single man, had time to spend with Paul, to get to know his heart, to disciple him, to travel with him. And of course, you have Paul, single man, able to write, over half of the books in the New Testament, able to plant more churches than anybody in history, I think. Mighty man of God 
If he'd been married, it would have been difficult for him. Would have been hard on his family. Because when you have children, you are responsible, guys. Some of the heroes in church history ran off and left their families. I'm not sure they should be heroes. Timothy. I don't know that he ever got married, but he was single when Paul was discipling him. And he became pastor of the church in Ephesus. Lydia. No record of her being married. She hosted the planting of a congregation in Philippi to be honored, a businesswoman. She may have been a widow. I don't know. Do some digging and let me know what you find out. Jesus Christ. (laughs) You know, people love to say, oh, Jesus was married as though that would have been a sin for him. He could have been married and it not been a sin. But for him to ascend back to heaven, that would have been a problem, to abandon the family he brought into the world, right? And there's that, that's just a pot shot that people try to think about and try to make Jesus a sinner. If, the, if he's a sinner, then there's no hope for any of us. He was a single man that was able to devote his life. He was mobile, committed. Naomi, a widow, she was able to minister to Ruth and help her find a husband and help her have a relationship with God. Anna, a widow, for many years, she'd only been married like seven years and then the rest of her life, I think she was in her 80s, in the temple fasting and praying. And she was able to meet the Messiah as a baby and prophesied the truth concerning him. And then the Ethiopian eunuch, known as Simeon Bacchus, He's traveling down the road in a chariot. He'd been to Jerusalem, and according to the Torah, he wouldn't be allowed to go in to the temple to worship with the rest of the people. Maybe they allowed him in the Gentiles' court, if that was functioning as that. So he goes home, you know, with this disappointment. Yeah, I'm a eunuch, yeah, 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 yeah. But he's reading from Isaiah 53. And Philip is sent by the Lord to minister to him. And Philip comes to him and says, do you understand what you're reading? And here's where he was reading. He says, I don't know. No, I have no one to explain it to me. He was reading from this place in Isaiah 53. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opened out his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who would declare his generation? for his life is taken from the earth. Now, for years, commentaries have have taken that second line, who would declare his generation, to mean uh, he didn't have a character witness, which is true. I mean, who spoke up for him at his trial? And they were all hiding under rocks and trees, right? Running home to mama. Running home to their families, right? Peter saying, I don't know the man. Blankety, blank, 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 blank. That's true, but it doesn't make sense. Who will declare his generation? The Hebrew there, word there for generation means posterity. The Bible in basic English translates, translates it as who has knowledge of his family, for his life was taken from the earth. This eunuch could identify with this. He wasn't being crucified, but when he died... He would die without a family. You know those parts of the Bible we like to skip, the genealogies? That's family from generation to generation. God's a God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, uh, Ephraim, Manasseh. The stories just go on and on with the bearing of children from one generation to the next. But when a eunuch dies, that's the end of their life. I think that's what this word is means who will declare his generation. The New English translation says, who can describe his posterity? For his life was taken from the earth. Both the NIV and the New Living Translation says, who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Christ died before he was married or had kids. This is a sad thing in the eyes of that culture. 
a sad thing for a eunuch. He could never have kids because of the surgery he had received. Whether it was willingly or not willingly, it is what it is. So this was a ramp for a eunuch to get to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And Philip took advantage of it, got on the chariot, and led him to the Lord and preached the whole gospel to him. And when they came to some water, he asked the eunuch, here is water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? And Philip said, only if you believe with all your heart. And he said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They both got in the water, and he immersed them. And the eunuch went on his way, and the Lord sent Philip somewhere else. Well, Ethiopian tradition says he went back to the queen. Her name wasn't Candace. That was the name of the position. Kind of like Caesar became the name of a position. That's where we get the name Czar or Kaiser. It's, it's a name referring to position. Abimelech was the same way. Pharaoh was the same way. So he went back to the queen and converted her according to Ethiopian tradition, and she built the first church building according to Ethiopian tradition in the first century. So let me ask you a question. When the eunuch died, did he die without descendants? Not spiritually. Look at this prophecy after Isaiah 53, you know, all about Jesus dying for us, then 54 breaks out into song. Sing, O barren, you who have not born. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. You know, when you make a big tent, you gotta go deeper with your stakes. Verse 3, for you shall expand to the right and to the left. Your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed, nor be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame. For you will forget the shame of your youth and will not remember the reproach of your widowhood any more. These are encouragement to a single woman. He's going to do such a work in redemption that they're going to have a life. There's going to be fruitfulness. Verse 5, for your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And your redeemer is a holy one of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife when you were refused, says your God. What encouraging words. Wherever you are in life, women, these verses speak to you. The story's not over. Whether you're married or single, you have a future, and fruitfulness is your portion. You're called to it. Why? As a result of Isaiah 53's fulfillment, he bore our shame. I love that part of that chapter. So we don't have to bear it anymore. Now, what about eunuchs? That was talking to women. Okay, thanks for asking. In chapter 56, it says, Do not let the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord has utterly separated me from his people. According to the Torah, Gentiles couldn't go into the important places in the temple. They had to stay out. But here's prophetically the Lord speaking to their children, saying, Don't say this. Don't say the Lord has forsaken you because you're a foreigner. Nor let the eunuch say, here I am, a dry tree. I'm not going to have any fruit. I got a bad diagnosis. My life is over. No, do not say that. Verse four, for thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath and choose what pleases me, and hold fast my covenant, even to them I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. This is good news for eunuchs. So keep in mind, Jesus was single. This is what he had to say about eunuchs. 
In Matthew 19, the latter part of verse 11, he says, all cannot accept this saying, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb. Okay, that can happen. And there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. That's what happened to Daniel and the three Hebrew boys. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs, not surgically, but living as eunuchs is what this means. For the kingdom of heaven's sake, he who was able to receive it, let him accept it. It's this truth that I'm proclaiming today that is the basis for a big denomination to forbid their priests to marry. But this is written to people that have the gift of celibacy. To require to people that does not have the gift is cruel. It's wrong. In fact, Paul, in one of his letters, rebuked those who were forbidding folks to marry. It's wrong. And now we have a problem we have today. Because men who did not have that gift did not enter the priesthood. So what they get in their desperation, they made men priests that should never have been a priest. So in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul's talking about marriage for the first five verses. And then he kind of shifts and he says, but I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. So he's saying this to people that had the gift of celibacy. For I wish that all men were even as I myself. But each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. So I have to write it, but it's not something that I'm putting on everybody. Okay? Verse 8. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. The translators added the word with passion. He goes on to say later on, verse 32, but I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he or she may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. Happy wife, happy life, right? There is a difference between a wife and a virgin. The word there for virgin is God's perception of single women that are living chaste lives. They're virgins in his eyes. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Happy husband, happy husband. (laughs) Sorry. Verse 35, and this I say for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, but for what is proper, and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. Is he saying marriage is a distraction? Well, I think it would be. If a person's gifted with celibacy, then why get married? It's a distraction when you have freedom from stuff. You've got self-control in areas that's needed for somebody to be completely devoted like Christ was. A wife, verse 39, is bound by law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, she's at liberty to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. But she is happier if she remains as she is, according to my judgment, He must have counseled some unhappy widows who got married too quick. And I think I also have the Spirit of God. He's not sure, but he thinks. And I think that he had the Spirit of God for him and for those that are gifted to live a single life. These are words of encouragement to take to heart. We are honoring singleness today. What does it take to live a fruitful single life? It takes the same thing that it takes to live a fruitful married life. The call to singleness points beyond ourselves. The call to marriage points beyond ourselves. It's no longer about me. 
I made a video once, you can find it on my channel. It's to the tune of Amazing Grace. Me, 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 me. And it's a slideshow of all the pictures in our culture that uh, are prone to appeal to selfishness. You can have it your way. I did it my way. If it is to be, it is up to me. It's all about number one, baby. And on and on it goes. I mean, I had a long version. My kids said, that's too long. But it was like five minutes of that stuff. So I shortened it to a minute and a half. The call to singleness points beyond ourselves. Singleness points to our need for a close walk with Jesus. Marriage does that too. Did you know that? Are you miserable and you're married? Do you have a close walk with Jesus? You need to. Singleness points to our God who purifies us as his people. Run to the Lord husbands. Run to the Lord wives. Run to the Lord singles. He's the one that purifies us as his people. The call to singleness points beyond ourselves. Singleness points to our Lord's sufficiency and his grace. Paul said he had a thorn in the flesh. Theologians have argued about what it was for centuries. But the bottom line, it was something he prayed about that the Lord didn't answer immediately. And it really bothered him because he'd seen so many prayers answered. You know, prison doors come open and miracles and signs and wonders and this thing won't go, won't change. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. What is God's grace? It's his undeserved empowerment. By grace are we saved through faith, and that is not of ourselves. We don't deserve to be saved, but God saves us and empowers us to do his will. For we are his workmanship, it goes on, called to walk in the steps that he laid out for us. So God's grace is sufficient, and sometimes that grace is empowerment to endure. When you get married, it's for better or worse for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health. It's commitment no matter what happens. Well, I didn't sign up for this. Well, maybe you need to redo your married vows. We did last Sunday and made sure it included that. If you're single, you're called to be committed to the Lord in sickness and in health, in prosperity and adversity, in good times and hard times. When things are great, when things are not so great, the Lord's grace is sufficient to enable you and I to endure when things aren't always going our way. It's the truth. Singleness points to our need to live in authentic community. I'm reminded of how the Lord used singles to heal our hearts. Yvette and I had started a church and then closed it a couple years later. And we're led to join Shady Grove Church where Olin Griffin was the pastor. And the church, you know, hundreds of people. And when service was over, we were hungry for fellowship and the families would just leave. But the singles were fellowshipping out on the parking lot, in the hallways, praying together. So we just joined in with them. There were two groups of singles, singles one, singles two. Singles one were the college graduates and the college students, the ones full of ideals. Singles two were the ones that had been through hell. Maybe they had been married. Maybe they had been tough. And they both ministered to one another. And they ministered to us. And eventually, I got the courage to lead a small group. And singles came to our group. The Lord used singles to build our confidence up when the married people didn't have time. Am I bitter? No. They've got their assignments, right? So you can minister to people as a married couple. And you can minister to people as a single person. But we're all called to live in authentic community. If, if your life is just your marriage, us four and no more, that's not healthy. That could lead to an ingrownness. That could, it, it, you need to stretch out the curtains of your habitation 
and open up your life more. I'm not saying not be committed to your marriage, not be committed to your children. Don't make them your whole life. Now, man, that doesn't mean to go out with the boys every night, but it means to, you know, allow one another to relate to people of the same gender. Um, You know what I'm saying. All right. Singleness points to our opportunities to serve his kingdom. So you hear of an opportunity to serve in some capacity that a married person just couldn't do? You can. And single people in this house do things like that. That's an advantage. Living beyond themselves. Singleness points to our future home in eternal heaven where it's going to be better. And you know what? In heaven, no one's married. Did you know that? The church is married to the groom. So the Lord doesn't share his bride with anybody, right? So he's not a bigamist, and we're not bigamists. We're married to Jesus only in heaven. You see that? So singleness points to that. It puts a longing in your heart for that day on a level that is unique. And finally... Singleness points to our calling to be conformed to the image of God's Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his dear Son. What is going on in your life? You are being conformed to the image of God's Son. Oh, what if gas goes up to $18 a quart? You're being conformed to God's dear son. What if the election doesn't go the way I think it should? You're being conformed to the image of God's son. What if my singleness is sometimes painful? You're being conformed to the image of God's son. What if my marriage is sometimes painful? You're being conformed to the image of God's son. That is plan A, and God's gifts and callings are without repentance. There is no plan B. He's making us like Jesus. He's getting us ready for heaven. He is. And this is what makes heaven stay heaven. We're surrounded by people who are like Jesus. You know what's bad about jail? It's not the bars. It's not the need to be remodeled, as they're saying about our local jail. It's not being pinned up. It's being in there with those people who are not like Jesus. The most annoying personalities you can think of are cooped up together. That is tough. That's why in many ways, prison is better than county jail. (laughs) You got some room to spread out. And boy, I'm so far off script, it's ridiculous. (laughs) Peter Hubbard, who wrote an amazing book, called Love and Delight. He pastors a Calvary Chapel in the Carolinas. He said, for the Christian, neither marriage nor celibacy is an end in itself. Instead, they are callings in which each of us are being transformed into the image of God's Son, Jesus Christ. It seems suffering and sacrifice will often play central roles in all our lives. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I pray in the name of Jesus that each of us would embrace the calling with which you've called us. As Paul said, he who is married, let him stay married. (laughs) If anyone's considering divorce, I pray, Lord, you'd bring repentance to that relationship in Jesus' name. And Lord, anyone who's called to singleness, I pray, Lord, they'd feel honored today that they would search out this subject and be affirmed in their identity and never again feel picked on or second class or substandard or some other thing that is not your heart. Help us as married people to have hearts for single people that is healthy and holy and pure and encouraging. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for the truth that changes lives. And we give you all the honor and the glory forever. Amen.
our testimony, everyone overcomes. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb, our testimony, everyone overcomes. of all of our praise for you all the king Jesus awesome and power forever awesome and great is your name case can be made that Mary Magdalene was not the first evangelist, but it was another single woman. Stay with me. In the story of the eunuch with Philip, he, Philip had just come from a mighty harvest in the, in the city of Samaria. Incredible things happened, and he passed the baton to the apostles from Jerusalem who came down to minister to the Samaritans. He baptized a lot of people, saw a lot of fruitfulness. What was a key to his fruitfulness there? It could have been because of what happened in John 4, where the Lord met a single woman who'd been married five times and was living with somebody, but she wasn't married to him. So she was single. Her bed was defiled, right? The Lord so changed her life that she went into the town. This is how bad it was. She went to get water at noon when nobody goes to get water. It's hot. She go there because of shame, no doubt, because of her lifestyle. But that was a town that had a well in the town. But she would go outside of town to get water. That's how bad it was. Going outside of town to get water at a time when no one goes to get water. The Lord ministered such life to her. She went into the town proclaiming the truth about Jesus and they came to check him out and persuaded him to stay with them for two days. And they said, now we believe, not because of what you said to her, but because of what Jesus said. That would never have happened were it not for this single woman with a changed life making a difference. If she had been married, she probably wouldn't have been there. She probably wouldn't have got to that well. She probably wouldn't have gone when she went. The Lord used her. So, you may be single today feeling condemned. Well, my past is keeping me from being fruitful. That is not true. Yeah, but you don't know what I've done. Well, the Lord knows. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you. Make his countenance be lifted up when he sees you. May he smile on you and give you his peace whether you're married or single. Be blessed and walk in peace and victory and let God use you mightily in spite of the past and in spite of the present conditions. In fact, because of them, go for it. Go get them, Tigers. God bless you. Amen.